Hi there. Welcome to another episode of Intriguing Beings with me, Rue Chater. Episode 11 with James Balding. Welcome back to another episode of Intriguing Beings. I've just got back from travelling around the UK where I've been recording a few more of these for the podcast. I've got some great episodes lined up for you and I'm sure you're going to enjoy the next few weeks. This episode features James Balding, a pro rider who has gone on to become the marketing manager for Cabrina Kiteboarding. James has had an interesting route into the sport and in this podcast we talk climbing, maths and even trumpets. Also how he became a kite surfing instructor so he could kite surf more and what happened when he, Aaron Hadlow, Sam Light and Tom Court decided to redefine the kiteboarding industry and what it meant to be a pro rider when they embarked upon the free ride project. I'll put a link into that video and some of the other videos that James has been in into the description so you can check those out because they're well worth a watch. James is an interesting character with a good outlook on the sport and his role as marketing manager gives him a rare insight into what goes on behind the scenes. I really hope you enjoy this week's episode. As ever, if you can give it a thumbs up, share it on social media, tell your friends about it down the pub, then that's fantastic. And if you feel like giving it a five-star rating on the App Store, then that's even better too. Thanks so much to everyone for tuning in to last week's episode with G. Atherton. It went down really well and we had some fantastic feedback on that one. So thanks for all the positive comments. Let's get on with this week's episode. Today I am stood in a kitchen with a gentleman called James Balding, who's got a bit of a bad back at the moment. So we're standing up so we can keep it stretched out. Um, James is an interesting character. He's a kite boarder um, who was involved in the sport quite early on and worked his way up to being an international level pro rider um, for a couple of different brands over the years. And now he is the marketing manager for Cabrina, which is one of the biggest kite boarding brands in the industry. So he's had quite an interesting journey i hate using that word but i keep using it but an interesting journey throughout his career and i just wanted to get him on the podcast and have a chat about some of his experience really because he's got some some good stories and he's got some good knowledge behind him and things like that so james i guess first question to you how did you get into action sports and water sports and things like that like from the very very early days wow we're probably going back uh probably when i was maybe eight or nine years old and I got into climbing that was okay. the first that was my first kind of main area of sport it was yep. I got I think my art teacher took us took me and my dad climbing because he was a math teacher at school yeah and he took us climbing and I was blown away so I was like this is this is what I want to do and then from there my dad used to take us to these lectures where we'd go and look at mountaineers they'd go off climb go to the Himalayas or places like that and then they'd come back and do these lectures at kind of Manchester University or that's where we grew up so he would take me as a kind of a little kid and would go and listen to these guys and they'd you know have these posters of them like hanging off you know K2 or Everest and all these kind of exciting places and I'd listen to them talk and it was like just I fell in love with it and so from then on I I wanted to be a mountaineer climber and so luckily in where we are now Manchester like the Peak District is there's a few on your doorstep it's really good climbing kind of outdoor stuff so I quickly fell in love with that and then all the way through school it was all about climbing basically and how to become you know emulate these guys that get sponsors to go off and you know they'll pay for these guys to go and climb some of the you know exciting peaks and come back and then give lectures and basically you know in in a similar vein to how kiting is you know be a a pro climber pretty much so that was the goal that was that was always the big thing uh how close did you get to that i'm not 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 that close at all (laughs) um i did all right when i was i remember like winning an event when i was 12 okay some climbing competition at the local kind of wall here um so I could climb but not obviously probably where I needed to be um and then probably when I was about 16 15 16 uh my parents bought me a a flexi foil stacker six the old classic um you know we used to mess around and we used to go up to Northumberland a lot and play with stunt kites on the beach and I always loved that 
um, the old typical British yeah. tough, tough upper lip, you know, <laughs> holiday where it's raining and <laughs> get out there it's and cold, the kite. but you get out there, you know, you put your, that, and that was what we used to do. And so they got me a bigger one, this six foot. And then as soon as I got that, I was like, nah, I definitely need the bigger one. So got a blade, I think a four, four meter or something. And then just used to get just dragged. fully kind of, it just switched in, in probably one day. It just suddenly the focus kind of changed. From climbing to kiting. Yeah, my parents always said it was, they thought the climbing was way too dangerous. So they wanted to get me into something that was a bit more <laughs> laid back. So that was their kind of... Their rationale behind it. Yeah, I don't know if it's actually... In the end, it was, I, I don't know, it probably ended up being, well, I guess climbing at high levels, incredibly, or it can be incredibly dangerous, but, yeah. you know, kiting nowadays actually is pretty safe, but at the time, it didn't really feel like kiting was that, that safe. No, way back in with, the day, it was definitely you know, dangerous. Releases that didn't really release. And didn't <laughs> if you, you saw them? a big front coming through, you were like... Run for the hills. <laughs> Pretty much should try and get the kite down now before I get lofted around. So, um, but yeah, that was. Didn't I hear that you had a fear of heights as well? Um, definitely not used to. But, but now I you think do. I think I feel now a bit more like it's it's starting to kind of take hold. Whenever I'm up at height, I'm starting to get a little bit of a kind of you know if I'm in an exposed situation, which is funny because I used to love it, and crave it, and. But even then, at times, I think exposure is something that everyone gets a certain level of, and it's learning how to manage it. You know, there's, there's, I mean, the guys that free climb now and push the limits that it's still, you know, the exposure never goes, but it's, it's how to manage it. Yeah. I um, guess it's one of those things. You could have ended up being a professional climber and suddenly got the jitters well, that would have been, <laughs> developed. That would have been a terrible. <laughs> We all going up Everest to be stuck at base camp, clinging to a rock, saying, no, don't take me up there. Yeah, bad bad choice of career to suddenly get (laughs) vertigo. Not the ideal character trait for a climber, for sure. And so when did you, um, you sort of playing around on the beaches with the the sort of flexi-foil power kites and things like that, at what stage did you take it to the water? And had you had any water experience, like in any other board sports or anything like that? Not really. I came to it fairly fresh. Um, we used to go off to the coast, uh, probably Blackpool, Liverpool area, and just mess around on land boards. But then obviously the guys were in the water doing it, and that just that was the logical next step. Bigger kites, and just got you know get into the water. And my last two, I mean, I, I was at school until uh, I think I left when I was eighteen, um, and always kind of had to work pretty hard from what I was doing. Um, but right at the end, I remember doing my final exams and trying to get out as soon as I'd finished because that summer holiday when you finish sixth form, you have so much time. Yeah. So I remember it was just as soon as I'd, I'd finished my exams, it was I was, it was great. I was going off kiting going on the beach and I would uh, got in at Newcastle uh, University and that's on the coast up there. So it was perfect. And that's basically where, you know, it took over the kiting. Yeah. Was there much of a scene up at Newcastle University for kiting or were you sort of on your own down the beach yeah, working it out? Not really, not really at all. Yeah, I remember putting a post on the forum. Um, in hindsight, it's probably not the, the, the greatest thing, but I put a post on a forum and a guy called Jeff picked me up in a white van in Asda <laughs> Car Park. <laughs> Took me kiting. Yeah, I got the Metro from my Hall of Residence with a gear bag to to meet this this you know Random guy that I met and he was Geordie Jeff and he picked me up and he took me off kiting. <laughs> that was the first of many like trips we bunked that I bunked off lectures and went off kiting with him when the forecast looked good and you know that was and then to this day we we still kind of you know keep in touch and for really? years after that we'd when I first the first year I went to Brazil was with him and it was through his friends that we ended up kind of staying with and no way. And those friends that we met then and now friends, actually, that she's uh, the girlfriend of Matt, uh, who's Kite World editor. So it's funny how this kind of, even back then, you meet these personalities. So, yeah, it's kind of like a a thumbs up for talking to strangers, really, that that developed. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess I've always, through my life, I've been fairly open to just just going with things really and, and doing 
probably not the most conventional route of, of doing things, but that just felt, I don't know, it was logical at the time. It was, I want to go kiting, don't have a car. How can I make How that How can happen? I go kiting? And, <laughs> and uh, that, was, that was just, that was logical to me, yeah. Um, what kind of level did you get to whilst you were at university? Were you sort of still just fairly amateur or were you getting pretty good quite quickly? Um, I, was, I wasn't that good at all. I think the, the problem is, especially at that time, I mean, the gear was good, but um, I wasn't getting out that much. And the, the times you'd go, it'd be freezing cold. So a lot of the time you'd it'd just be Baltic and then we weren't getting kind of quality time. I remember, you know, if you got a session where it was really kind of, you got a lot done, you could progress, but a lot of the time you were getting lofted around, trying to pull your release, untangling lines or changing kite size. Um, I remember the the last session I had before graduating was when I started doing unhooked railies. So that was my first kind of foray into unhooked riding. Freestyle. Yeah, and from then it kind of, it all... And there's another interesting story while we're talking about university that I'm going to bring up you might hate me for, but you're also a bit of a trumpeter. (laughs) (laughs) And you've got quite a prestigious musical career. Um, What's the story behind that, just quickly? Um, Well, that was... Both my parents are incredibly musical. So from a young age, we both me and my brother played... Well, we both played violin, and then on the side, I, I got into playing trumpet. And so all the way through school, that was the big thing. We had a really good music department, so I put a lot into that. Um, and then the university had a really good big band, so trialed out in the beginning and got in. And so that kind of became my social kind of aspect of university. We used to gig a lot and play in clubs and have smaller groups that would do kind of you know tours, bits and pieces, just to get some money. Was, on the side and it was it was fun we you know we'd bus we did the edinburgh festival a few times that's pretty cool um so it was just i mean as a, as a young it? person in university it was brilliant it had everything that i wanted socially and and it you know it kind of that was that was a big focus really while i was studying and yeah. weren't, weren't you sponsored by greg's at one point for free sausage rolls <laughs> <laughs> i used to um temp for a brass band yeah and we got paid and they were sponsored by Greg, so <laughs> we did a few, some of the like the March competitions, and if it went past the Greg's, we'd go in and they'd just huck us up with loads of pasties and su- sandwiches, and it was brilliant because we had our Greg's bakery suits on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, that's so funny. Was I mean, for anyone listening doesn't know what Greg's <laughs> is, it's like a massive, uh, huge chain of bakery shops, basically. There's lots of <laughs> in jokes about them over here in the UK. Um, and then it's quite interesting what you studied at university as well, because you're you're now a marketing manager, but you studied maths at university. So when you were at uni, did you have, or when you were younger, did you have a goal or an idea of what you wanted to be when you were older, or did you just not really have any clue and you were just following a path of what you were good at? Um, I think I've always never really had a clear path of what I've wanted to do. And when I look back now, I kind of I can see that fairly clear that even at the beginning i i didn't know what to to really study um i just maths was one subject that i could do um really well uh, so i did a lot of it and then other kind of similar subjects to that and then deciding when where to go to university i i didn't i didn't really know what to study i was looking through all the prospectuses and you couldn't i just couldn't decide on something so my dad was like you know if it's if you if you like maths do you know, just do it it's I mean he did it and people that you talk to it's being kind of a logical degree it's it's probably more useful than so many degrees out there and, and also when you look at what everyone does what they do after maths although there's a lot of people that do accountancy finance banking stuff like that a hell of a lot of them also go off into other forms of kind of business it's not just that because it's it's a kind of logical yeah. process of what you know the brain learns and even though a lot of stuff at university we were doing was just proofs just endless pages of stuff that I really don't know what it was you know a proof of a formula I had no idea really what it was being used for it's that process of working through a problem logically it obviously has you know real life application and, and that's what people have always said so I, I 
Yeah. I think I took that advice and because I didn't really know what to do, I just did, did that. Did something you enjoyed. And um, yeah, yeah, which is funny because at the time I didn't really like, I, I chose that because I hated writing essays. I liked the fact that there was a right answer. Yeah. And a wrong answer, basically. And with kind of writing essays and things, it's a lot more... Subjective. Yeah. And, and in the end, when I start, when I ended up kiting a lot, I actually really grew to love writing, writing for magazines, editorial stuff. Um, I think that's probably where kind of my mum's side came in because she was, uh, she did English at university. So it was something that, you know, we, I had the kind of English maths thing, but I, I was just forged down the maths route. Yeah. Um, but actually now I, I probably use quite a lot of the English. I'm quite thankful that my parents always told me that when to it. say, you know, my friend and I, or <laughs> <laughs> when to use the right kind of spelling. Although actually now, because we work for, or Cabrina does a, a lot of its staff's American, we end up using the everything's in Z's version. and U's and they can't spell aluminium properly. So <laughs> it always does me in a little bit when, when I'm doing copyright and stuff and I'm going through the product books. And But uh, yeah, no, I, I do... I do quite enjoy that side of it, you know, sitting down now and actually, you know, writing, writing and things like that. Yeah. I guess creatively. it's always good to have a good foundation in those core skills. And that's the reason why schools teach you maths and English as a base level, because it, you know. Gives yeah. You a good, yeah, definitely. And I was lucky. I went to a good school. So it was something that, and both my parents were very, you know, this is, they were very diligent with teaching and, and all the way through life studying, basically. So it was. It was good life lessons that I learned. Yeah. And so when you're leaving university, you're doing unhook Rayleigh's. Yeah. What happened next? <laughs> yeah, well, pretty much around the time of applying for jobs, I just, um, I was really getting into kiting and um, I was looking at all these different accountancy firms and I knew it was just, I just needed to do something different and I had a couple of friends that worked in the, in the, um, the sailing industry they worked for mark warner a british holiday company okay um and he was a windsurf instructor and he would always he would do that in the summer holidays when he was at uni and he was like oh you should just you should go they're doing kiting now you should go and become a instructor so it's pretty much what i did applied for a job in they just set up a, a kite school in egypt was that with mark warner yeah so that was with them and um basically applied and um got it and then as soon as i finished my studies basically left didn't miss graduation, missed all really? of that. Because just basically, Seems they were like, how, how soon can you start? And I was like, just straight away, as soon as my exams are done, packed up, said goodbye to all my friends and um, and left for Egypt. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And how was that? I guess, I mean, I've done similar sort of jobs to that in the past. You end up working quite hard because you're having to teach people all day long. Did you get much time to kite for yourself when you were there? Um, yeah, I did luckily because it was, because it was so new. Um, we actually, there, there wasn't really that much take up of lessons. Lessons. So I, so, I, and my manager was pretty, pretty good actually. He kind of let me do my own thing a bit. So I was kiting a lot. That's really where it all helped Start me get better because the day to day I was, I was kiting all morning, every morning. Um, and then maybe I'd kind of do a few lessons or help out with safety in the, in the afternoons. Um, but it, I mean, it was good because it wasn't, you know, you're working as part of a big team. Um, that I, I did learn a lot through working with these kind of managers and also how it is to work with customers. Um, we, you know, we, we, I quickly kind of ended up running the, the kite center or the, the operation that they had there. Um, and through that, it kind of taught me a lot about not just, you know, teaching, um, but basically kind of management at a pretty young age really where you, you you're thrust into yeah you know working with people of all from all walks of life which i love that was what i really did enjoy like working with people not just the staff but then the guys that you'd teach for a week and then um you know you could really get a good relationship with them seeing them develop and yeah and just just talking to you know meeting new people from all over the place and all these different industries and um, working with guys that wanted to learn to kite and they were from I don't know, finance or medical industry or all these different you know sectors of work and that I, re I got a lot out of and seeing how they learned so I think it's good for 
I think teaching kiting is a pretty good thing to do um, because it gives you a good grasp of A, how people learn, you know, seeing things, you pick things up pretty fast, you get a good overview of, you know, what what it takes for someone to learn and also the equipment because you, you really see how it's used, things that are important, how yeah. things break, maintenance. Um, so even at a kind of relatively early point, I was still you know, quite invested in equipment and yeah. kites. And at that time, I, I did really want to, you know, become a, a cool dude. <laughs> um, but I needed something to pay for it still. Yeah. So that was, that was an, and it wasn't a lot of money, but it was your, your, your it was board. It was fun. It was, it was lively. The, yeah. You know, you, you, we, we do our fair share of drinking and Having then a bit of a good time, roll into work a couple hours later and, Definitely shouldn't have been teaching or driving power boats with, <laughs> with, with customers but a few times, but sunglasses on and just yeah. sunglasses <laughs> and a hat. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and, and just get through it really. Um, but it, oh, I learned a hell of a lot. It was t- something totally different. To and what before. did you do in the winters? Did you because Egypt can be a year round centre. So were you there for sort of the whole time or were you coming back and doing something different in the winter? What was the score there? Um, yeah, so I, the, my first summer uh, I went off snowboarding. I went and worked as a ski technician um, and learned the kind of the trade with uh, servicing skis and stuff. I just wanted to get away and do a do a winter. I'd not, I'd yeah. not really, I'd skied and snowboarded but not really Done put too winter. much time into it. So I did that. Um, but I was really kind of missing kiting and that was something that I'd identified that I really, you know, wanted to do to as best as I could to my ability. Um, so pretty much I did the season then and, and got straight back out to Egypt again to do another kind of stint in the desert. And, and it was probably after that year that I felt the progression had come quite a long way and um, kind of seeing pretty much what, what the level was and, I think it was after that second season I tried a couple of the, the British competitions with some yeah. of the other guys. Because there was quite a good, was, next thing I was going to ask you about, there was quite a good British scene back then in terms of the competition scene. And, you know, there were some pretty heavy hitting riders kicking yeah. about. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was really cool because obviously at that time, I think, I think Aaron was, I don't know how many times world champion was at the time, but he was still, he was probably the guy that I was looking up to a lot in the industry and, you know, you'd see the videos from Brazil and his projects that he was doing. So that was obviously, it was kind of a big benchmark. Um, but he was not really doing so much kind in the of UK, in the yeah. UK. He'd come back and I met him a couple of times and from then. And But the other friends like Sam and Tom and Ali Barrett and Robin Snugs and a few of those guys that, that there was always a really good van kind of atmosphere. Everyone would go to the events in their vans and... You know, and, and the level was was really good. If you think about where those guys are now, they're all kind of, you know, they all have good contracts with with brands, and they've done really well for themselves. And it's you, you look back, and that was kind of, you know, Great time. Everyone from where it kind of started, just you know, it wasn't. It was it was a bit different to where it is now. Yeah. How many years were you doing the UK competition scene for? I think I did it a couple times. I did it. I remember doing it. Um, I did it. I did it once as an amateur. I think I won that and thought, well, I should probably do the next one up. And then um, the next year, I remember doing it all year. All I think we had six events, which is quite good That's for quite a, a for a UK for a, kind yeah, of tour, a national, national tour. tour. And that was all around the UK, and it was in the summer. It was quite well supported. And um, yeah, I, mean, I I came runner up to Sam. So, so second, yeah, never quite got the British title. Uh, no, no, never. I remember because Lewis had it before, and then Sam was uh, he was he was there, and uh, so kind of second fiddle to him. Um, but then it was through those kind of uh, meetings that we became good friends, and and it was uh, just fr- from then that we kind of started travelling together and. Doing did you do thing, any really. international competitions at that time, or did you just stick to the UK? Uh, I didn't. I, it was. I guess it was in my mind, but I, I, pr- I probably psyched myself out that I was never good enough. Um, it was funny. I never, I never really 
identified that I would want to do any of them. I never figured that was going to be good enough to, to make a dent. Um, I was pretty kind of pragmatic in the way I looked at things and figured that these guys were going to be better than me all the way through. And, um, maybe it's more of a kind of a cynical view of it, but then at the same time, I, I thought it was fairly, I identified that I wasn't going to be as good as any of those guys. So looked at other ways to, to make things work. Yeah. Do things differently. Cause you were part of, um, I guess a kind of original crew of, free riders for want of a better word <laughs> <laughs> I hate using it but yeah. you know it sort of started this trend of oh um you know previous to that if you wanted to be a pro kite boarder you had to go and win competitions and then you got given a contract and then you went and did more competitions and tried to win the world title and yeah that was kind of the path that everybody took and then I think it was you Sam Tom and Aaron just suddenly checked out of that mm. scene I guess and just did something completely different yeah. What was the driving force behind that? Whose idea was it? Or was it just something that evolved naturally? Yeah, I mean, it kind of evolved naturally, but it happened at the right time. I think Aaron had just, he was ready to have a break from the tour. And it was for the for the rest of us, we were in the right kind of time and place. And and it, it just it, it just came about, really. I mean, we, we started in Australia and we did that. And um, it was basically from there, we, we wanted to be somewhere to kite and spend the the season really um and it just it it just came about me and tom had always been really into kind of messing around with cameras um that was probably i've always been interested in it from from a young age shooting stills and and then it it quickly kind of got into video as well so uh it, it just worked everyone was at the right time and then I think it was, I think, I remember it was, was one evening, I think we were sat at home and we were like, we, you know, we should, we should do this. We should sat, we shouldn't, you know, push down this competition route. We've got something that we could do. Let's, let's go and make our own thing. And I think it was happening a lot in the skiing side. Yeah. I used to watch when I was working in the Alps, uh, snowboard seasons, you would, would always have the videos on, um, of the, you know, the, the, the season videos, you know, you, all these different companies that make their their videos like Matchstick, Ten Gravity, Poor Boys, all these videos that make these amazing films and you know, these guys just lived the life. They yeah. didn't compete, they just did what they wanted, shot their video parts, got the stuff in the mags, and it was that was that was something that a model that worked in another industry. So we're like, well, it has to work in this industry. Let's we've got magazines, we've got, you know, it was, it was, it was the right time. So we did that first one and, and it went down pretty project well. project video, right? The first one. Yeah, yeah. The, the, original. the original. It's funny, people, people still to this day kind of always talk about that or, you know, even, I mean, when we look back, I mean, the level of riding wasn't that great, but it just, I don't know, the concept. It was the first feature-length yeah. movie for some time. We didn't so. even think it was going to be much of something, but I remember when we, f- we finally finished the edit on it, when me and Tom finally got it out, we put it online and it just started, you know, it kind of did its thing. And um, yeah, to this day, it's kind of one of those that people talk about, even though it was... I look back and think, oh, I was pretty rough around the edges. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have any support to put it together or was it something that you were kind of funding or was it just funded through your own sort of sponsorships? Um, yeah, we just did it ourselves, really. I mean, we got, everyone was probably on different levels of support by their own brand, but um, so we, we, we did it ourselves. We, we kind of chose a few destinations we were all going to go to and then, you know, did, that, did it like that. I guess it helped that you guys were filming each other, so that's a, a good bonus. Who did the lion's share of the filming on that first one? <laughs> <laughs> was well, it equally shared, or were some people not so keen to pick up the camera and just wanted to ride all the time? You don't have to name names. <laughs> name I'm, de- names. I'm definitely going to name names. <laughs> I'm sure most people listening to this are probably able to guess. But, um, yeah, we had, to, we had to do it so that it was always me or Tom with a with camera. with a camera so it it ended up being uh a lot of the time me and sam riding and then tom and aaron riding so yeah you know that was the way it worked. nothing worse than having a whole session of filming and getting back and all, everything's out of focus but, um... <laughs> <in the sky. laughs> 
But um, the good thing with that is we always had two angles on stuff, so we got quite a lot done. And even though it was hard sometimes, the conditions would be amazing, and, and everyone obviously wants to ride, but you know, we, we were like, right, who goes at first? You two ride, those two film, and then you swap round. And we were pretty regimental about that. And that was, I think that was the difference with, it. I think, a lot of the time with with people and a lot of the riders now, they're always, you know, they kind of don't really want to muck in and do the, the hard yards. They just want people to point the camera at them. And that that was a big thing that uh, we did as a kind of, as a group. And it, and it brought us on as, it got us close as friends to um, having that kind of, you know, those, the ups and the downs doing that. And, the good times, you know, it was, it was, it was good. Um, and then, uh, we, me and Tom pretty much edited it and, and How it, and it kind of, that must have taken quite a while because I'd imagine you'd have absolutely heaps of footage from going to all those locations and filming. Yeah. And it wasn't too bad there. actually. Cause we, we kind of edited them, them in parts anyway and trips and we just hashed it together with a bit of interview clips. Really. It was, it was. It wasn't too bad at all, actually. A few cups of tea. <laughs> yeah, definitely. A few cups of tea, a few Skype calls, and and it was it was done. It, it wasn't it wasn't a big project at all. Um, so yeah, it worked out. It worked out really well. And from that, it kind of we had it, it made us pretty close as friends. Um, and we would you know go off to these events like Triple S together, and we'd stay in a house together, and it kind of bonded us as I guess you know it's quite nice being Brits to stick together and yeah it was good it, it really you know that, that was that time was, was a good few years everyone was kind of on the up in in their own you know what they were doing and it was everyone was it was working yeah and that was around the time when you know events like the Triple S were starting to become more popular I guess in terms of there's you know the the, the wider mass of the kiteboarding population was starting to take take a bit more notice of this new direction that kiteboarding was going where you guys were hitting features and things like that how do you think that's changed over the years um from those sort of early days of putting a small little slider out at woodman's point to <laughs> where we're at now um i mean those guys have always led from the front with it you know they identified pretty early what what some of the riders wanted to do, you know, Dre and Sleazy and um, some of those guys and, and Davey from Charleston, those guys that kind of really got the Triple S going, real, you know, stuck with it, said, all right, they'd put some money up, backed it. And, and it really kind of went from strength to strength each year. And I mean, it's testament to the event that, you know, now, I, I can't remember, I think it's like 15 years or something on, they've had an event every single year. It gets better and better and better. The features get better. The, you know, the prize money's one of the best comps in, in the industry. And they do it. They, they put it on. You know, they, they, they go out and they, they sort it themselves and it gets the best riders. And, you know, I think it, it's kind of a, a good marketing example how they how they do it and... um and go from there with you know how they brand the sliders and how there is you know value to it and and also now where the level of riding is like these guys are pretty you good know, these days throwing down it it turned it's definitely turned from a a party event to a competition now it's quite serious yeah that the, the kind of the last couple of years before I stopped going it was yeah it used to be it was pretty free and easy and you know everyone rocked up and but it was it was rider and judge, so you know at the end of the week it was just it was a ballot basically. So it was about having a good time, and, and the parties used to be pretty off the hook. Um, but it did kind of change into a competition, um, which was a good thing as well, because that really improved the level. You know, yeah. People took it seriously. There was no more so much kind of you know, getting lashed before you had to go out and ride. It was, it's good money on the line now. And, you know, the riders really stepped up to it. So yeah, start taking it a bit more seriously. It really, you know, the level now of what these guys are doing, it's, it's, it's really impressive, yeah. You know, you've done the free ride project. Uh, you guys have sort of discovered that you no longer have to do competitions and things like that. 
How was that going for you as a, a pro rider at the time? Like, were you with Cabrina by then? Had you moved to those guys? Where were you at? Um, yeah, pretty much probably where things got a bit more, stepped things up. Um, I had a really good few years with with Liquid Force. They always, you know, it was really good times with those guys. Um, and then it came a good opportunity to work with Cabrina and, and kind of be a bit more involved um, behind the scenes um, and it was something that I've always been interested in I, I knew that especially probably even at that time that um, I, I didn't want to just just ride all the time and even on a kind of personal level it, I didn't get as much satisfaction out of it you know the, the session I still loved a good session but it wasn't the fact that I was waking up thinking I've got to learn this trick today and because you know I need to be at a certain level I still loved kiting and everything about it, but didn't feel that pressure to. I needed more of. I needed something that was more kind of fulfilling. Um, you know, I, 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 that had been you know quite some years after graduating, and I think I'd. I needed something more kind of stimulating involved. Even though I, you learn a lot, and everything that I was doing was with the on the side, the video work and. Um, so, I mean, during that time, I'd, I'd done a lot of freelance work in that kind of outside of the industry. Yeah. Um, that I'd set up um, working with certain companies um, in the UK. And that really kind of got me into just trying to do more, really, um, get something outside of just kiting. And, and that's where I, I, I did get way more of a kind of, of an enjoyment out of, you know, kind of working yeah, for so a company and and more in line with doing things, turning your video skills to a bit of a, a yeah gig, I guess, rather yeah, than just pretty much knocking out films with your buddies and sticking them online and watching the view counts, but not watching the bank account change. Yeah, exactly. And uh, were the brand, you know, were the brands receptive to you guys deciding to sort of change the way that kiteboarding professional riders were behaving in the sense that you know we're not doing competitions we're just going to go and make all this media were they quite like oh how's that going to work or were they behind it and like yeah that sounds great you guys go off and make a film for us and we'll be happy with that uh they were really supportive i think if you did it in the right way um i think there was a level of trust involved um but you know that's i think that that still holds true now um from kind of where i see it I think that's if you can really trust someone to go off and do a job, then, you know, it doesn't really matter what it's more. The question more is in the trust of, you know, what someone's doing. Um, if you can trust them to get on and do, you know, a really good piece of work, then I'm interested to hear whatever, you know, whatever idea that is, um, you know, if it's competitions or it's going off and creating content, if there's a good kind of plan to it and you know, someone's going to take it really seriously, then, then it works and I think that's why with with producing content if if someone can go out and really kind of you know get stuff done then 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 it's really worth it you know all the brands need content yeah they're so content hungry the whole time um everything's kind of changed now before it would be you know you'd make a video and it would be really current you know people would talk about it it would do the rounds on the internet now people are making videos every few days you know they're making vlogs they're making these clips that are just throw away 30 seconds so everything just gets consumed in the content so it's really hard so pretty much you know one one way of of you know part of the plan you, you, you need to kind of come up with this massive amount of content so you need that coming in from these riders yeah um on the kind of other hand, you still need, I think you need that kind of really quality pieces of, you know, content that really, you know, has, has a bigger effect on someone watching it. Um, and also for the industry as a whole, you know, you need these projects that people talk about, you know, it's hard if it's, if it was just Instagram clips, you just, you just miss it. You yeah. Know, I, I think you that you need those longer forms of media. The bigger projects that yeah. have a bit more longevity to them rather than just a quick swipe past and yeah i mean that's a on a personal level as well you know I'm, i really i like the creative side of that and i guess i appreciate what goes into a a good edit or you know a really nicely taken picture um that's something i really appreciate and i, I think people 
are starting to see that now. I think there's a slight change. Um, it's not just everyone's, you know, content hungry. I think there is things like podcasts that are, you know, longer forms of of media. It isn't just, you know, five second swipes. And yeah, people have to invest a bit of time into it. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I, I think there is there is an aspect of that that's that has changed, and um, there is need for these parts of media. Yeah. Last question before we get on to the sort of more current stuff, but something I saw, I guess, as a magazine editor around the time that you, Aaron, Sam and Tom went off and did the free ride project films was there was a real shift, I guess, before that people looked up to Aaron, they looked up to Sam, they looked up to Lewis and they were like, oh, this is the path. I have to do competitions, have to do competitions, have to do competitions. And that was a real focus. And then you guys went off and did that and it kind of changed the game. And it was almost like everyone was like, oh, forget competitions. We've just got to go off and make videos. And all of a sudden you were getting like two pro riders turn up to a pro competition in the UK. Do you guys feel that, you know, you have any responsibility for that? Or do you just think, well, you know, we were there changing the game and it is what it is? (laughs) Um, I I do remember quite a bit of animosity between the guys that were competing and us you know they 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 didn't really like it they thought that I mean level wise they're probably technically better riders and obviously if if I went into a competition with one against one of them I'd I'd get schooled Um, so there was definitely at that time I remember there was there was kind of bad feelings towards it Um, so yeah I mean following on from that if, if people kind of I think people just saw that that was one way to do it and if, yeah. if we were getting picked up and supported by it they also thought well well if I'm not better than him then then I uh, then I'll, I'll, I'll that pretend route. that I do the same <laughs> um, but you know that's not a that's not a kind of on its own it's not something that doesn't uh, it's something that in I mean, in business or in, in all of walks of life, that's, you know, that's natural selection. You know, yeah. if, if someone's slightly worse off in something, you know, they have to figure out what their strong points are. Yeah, what they I can mean, do that's, to pick that's life. <laughs> I guess there was, a, there was certainly an element I felt at the time where people forgot that you'd all done competitions. You know, Tom had been competing for years. Aaron had been competing for years. You and Sam had been competing for years. And it was almost like... People just forgot all that and thought, oh, all I need to do is go and make a, a five minute edit and I can be a pro rider. And mm. it was just kind of a bit of a, a shame at the time that they hadn't realised that actually doing competitions and putting the legwork in is a great way to improve your level and get that base level up. And then you can think about going and doing the kind of stuff that you guys were up to. Yeah, definitely. Um, it was kind of one of those things at that time where everyone became a free rider. <laughs> <laughs> or you know, I'm not sure about that whole term, but I still just see it as a, you know, it was just a different path. Yeah. yeah, it was just like a personal choice. It wasn't like we, I was trying; we were trying to do anything different. It was just, you know, on a personal level, it was it was a way that we kind of identified as how, what what we wanted to do. Yeah, we didn't want to compete. So, you know, if if someone if the brands hadn't supported it, then we still probably have done the same thing. I imagine because um, it was a, it was kind of in life where we where we, where you wanted to be where we were as as kind of as as just kiters really it was yeah. everyone was whoever it was I mean Aaron was I guess kind of wanted to do something different and and we all kind of felt a bit the same and that's why it was just right time right place really um, yeah and in recent years you then went on to become the team manager at Cabrina and now the marketing manager. How did that come about? Like what, what steps did you, were you in the right place at the right time when you got bumped from rider to team manager or was it just something that you wanted to do or something that you worked towards? How did that come about? Um, yeah, I, I definitely, I mean, it was one reason to, to join Cabrina. It's, it was a, a, a brand that really kind of looks after staff, uh, riders, even as a rider, I felt, instantly kind of part of the team i remember that literally the first as soon as i'd got uh, picked up by them and went over into the office and and got kind of involved in a, in a meeting basically it was a marketing meeting from kind of right at the beginning because because of probably we were planning for the, the first photo shoot that i was at and 
literally walked into a meeting with Pete um, Anders, who was a videographer at the time, a few other guys that work in the office, and I was a part of it, part of the planning for it. Um, and That's that nice, kind of made me feel like I was instantly part of the furniture. Because um, a lot of brands, that doesn't happen. You're just a pro rider and you're out in the wilderness being a pro rider. So. Yeah, yeah, it was, it, was, it was kind of, it was really nice. It was a good feeling. And so from pretty much from that first day, I felt a level of kind of loyalty that, that you know, I've not really felt before. And, and that was, I definitely kind of said, right, well, this is, you know, this is a, a, basically an, an opportunity and I'll do my all to, to kind of, you know, prove my worth. And from then just really kind of worked quite closely with the marketing manager straight away from day one um, at the time. And kind of when I was out in Maui in the office, I, I kind of worked basically same hours as those guys. And if I wasn't kiting or surfing, I'd, I'd go into the office and kind of help out, offer to help whatever they needed um, and work with them on, you know, I learned what they needed and a lot of that ended up being, you know, content and things like that. And that, that was things that I could basically yeah, offer them. Um, you know, if it was whatever it was, if it was extra shots for something, I could go out and shoot it. Or if they needed it as a rider, I'd go out and ride it. So you were putting so, yourself forward to do that. So it was kind of off your initiative, I guess, that you were like, right, this is a good company. How can I be more useful rather than I'll take my salary, kick back and ride all day at the beach? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, but that's, you know, that's that's how I... That's how I, you roll. <laughs> well, I, well, I think that's how most people that's, um, that, you know, wants to succeed <laughs> in life. You've got to put yourself into, you know, you've got to strive to, to a, you know... To achieve things. <laughs> Sounds <than>. terrible. <laughs> you've got to strive you to achieve. You've got to strive to achieve things. But it's true, like, if you don't put yourself out there... <laughs> You know, you could have taken that salary from Cabrina and just been a pro rider. You know, countless riders do exactly that. So by taking yourself out of your, not necessarily comfort zone, but taking yourself out of your, your remit from them to do that little bit extra obviously makes you stand out a little bit more, which is why I guess it led to them making you the team manager overall. Mm. What was it like um, moving on to that team manager role? I mean, I guess you've probably already been half doing it anyway if you were popping into the office and helping out as much as possible and getting involved with photo shoots and things like that yeah it, it was it was quite a, a nice transition um good thing was i knew most of the riders at the same time anyway yeah because you've been um, riding with them and you're part of the team so yeah and, and already kind of at shoots i'd stopped riding most of the time so i was trying to help out on the content side because it's always it's quite a scramble product shoots things there's always just unlimited shots you need and it's and it's tough on you know getting stuff the organization it's not always that easy if you've got loads of riders and so um i stepped i stepped in pretty uh, early into that and tried to kind of help out with it um and it, i guess it helped cuz most of the time if i wasn't behind the camera i'd be in front and then you can kind of you know pretty quickly what needs to be be done at, at these kind of shoots um so it was i mean it was good because a lot all the guys that are on the team i was good friends with anyway so um it was and it's it quite was a fun. small team at cabrina isn't it it's not like the world's biggest kite team considering the size of the brand yeah we try and keep it really kind of to a a tight knit kind of group of guys that we can give them a lot of our time and and support really you know we try and make sure we have every rider's you know that's that's not only really talented um but also they kind of have a fit to the brand yeah. you know it's not just take x amount of riders because we need to hit certain you know numbers or or demographics it's there's definitely a you know we try and take a certain type of rider that that we know will be a good fit and also if they're on the beach will be a good ambassador for the values that that kind of come from the top and and that's one thing working with you know that Pete kind of does everything transcends down from that he he's very you know he has his his ideas and also really kind of solid brand values and personal values um and that's always you know the that comes from the top 
um, you know, and that's something that he wants to instill into the, the people that sell, ride, enjoy the product. And what sort of, you know, as a marketing manager now, I'm sure there's going to be people listening to this and think, oh, I'd like to be a pro rider. What sort of thing are you looking for from a pro rider these days? You know, what, what's your ideal makeup of someone that you would think, yeah, that's a good guy. We're going to get him on board and sign him up. Um, I think there's, 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 a, there's not one, one thing. You know, different riders can have attributes that other riders might not have, but that doesn't necessarily make them less you know, marketable. Um, I think you've, you've, you've got to stand out you've got to have something that's different if it's your style of riding if it's something that you can bring if it's your skills as whatever you know there's 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 now lots of different types of rider it's it's not just the competition rider or the free rider or the you know the industry's it's grown and and also now there's so much going outside of the industry with outside industry sponsors looking in so there's there's ways that kiters can make their money not not just being a rider within the kite industry. Um, there's really kind of good ways to make money with you know, things like YouTube, um, these big outside industry sponsors coming in looking for looking for content. Um, so I wouldn't say there's there's a one you know a one fit all. Um, I'd say for you know what we look for is there's you've you've kind of got to wear a few different hats. I'd say it's the, I don't think the industry's so big that you can just you know kind of it's not surfing yeah that's probably what i'm trying to say it's you know small. it's it's not there where you you know you're that good that someone scouts you on the beach and then slaps a few stickers on the nose of your board and, Gives and you, you just you just have the dream life um it's it's not at that stage i would say so you definitely have to be um, a bit more adaptable multifaceted yeah <laughs> have a few strings to your bow rather I think than so just yeah one. I think just being really really hard work king is, is is a big is a big plus and still probably my my number one thing is if someone sends you an email you reply to it <laughs> preferably preferably fast yeah <laughs> or have you know it's 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 a good thing to to do. I yeah. mean, it's a life lesson that I'm sure anyone that's been successful in industry or business is you know highly aware of. It's not always uh, it's not always the case. And what's the you know now you're the marketing manager at Cabrina, which is one of the biggest kite brands on the planet. How hard is it to come up with new sort of brand focus ideas and how you're going to sell this year's kite? You know you've you've sold so many kites last year what what sort of approaches do you take to keep things fresh so when it comes around to 2019 you're like yeah this is the focus we're going to have um it's it's it can be tough things like that um because the way that i guess the industry's changed it's it's had quite a, a good run now um but there's, I think the cool thing at the moment is there, there's still, there's things changing. Like foiling is a huge new buzz and there's so much new product that's, that's coming out, revolving around that. And it, because it's quite a different, a different kind of take on, on the sport, it's exciting. So, um, there's, there's, there's good opportunities for kind of different styles of advertising on that. And, um, but I mean, we've, it's it's going probably back to working with people in the team um, that basically every, everyone that works for the brand, they, they get out and they ride all the time. Everyone loves the sport. They're, they're not doing it as a job, just a job. It's, it's a passion. So, you know, when you, when you're talking, even if it's outside of work, most of the time you still end up talking about kiting or if it's a weekend, you'll be out kiting with, the guys in the office or whoever it is so it's there's there's always going to be those ideas being bounced around it's not just a kind of nine to five thing yeah and if you're talking doing it all the time and you're seeing these trends that that, that you know if something's changing or you're seeing something that's that you know you kind of can get from another industry or you see something that that you like then then it then it works 
you spend quite a bit of your time traveling still and obviously travel's been a huge focus of your life do you still enjoy packing up a bag and jumping on yet another airplane or are you getting to a stage of your life where you're like oh, i quite like to settle down um both yeah i definitely need more uh, stability i've noticed that in travel i can't travel all the time it, it, it's too it does weigh you down um I don't necessarily mind the travel. I think it's the constant travel that I don't yeah. really like. So um, I spend quite a lot of time in Maui in the office, but that's fine because it's kind of my home there now as well. So instead of just being a destination for a couple of weeks, it's kind of a second home. Um, it's it's probably the kind of, you know, the constantly living out of a bag that does weigh you down. Um, there's something I still quite, I love getting on an airplane yeah, I don't know. There's, a, there's a feeling. A yeah, you know, just rocking up to the airport. I'm not really into the whole stress of just turning up and trying to think what type of bag you've got, where you're not going to have to pay so much money and see what you have to pretend to beat the system. But um, as soon as you've you've got your bags all checked in, there's there's nice kind of a weight of, of air, and even when you're on the plane, it's kind of not being connected to Wi-Fi. Is is a time to just just yeah zone out i do enjoy those kind of those long journeys sometimes and being somewhere new but i think after a while when you've done quite a lot of traveling you, you need a bit more stability and that's definitely something that i'm now at. I, I definitely want that are there any destinations that you've not been to that you've still got high on your list that you'd really like to go and check out um Wow, there's, there's endless destinations, yeah. I think I'd love to, um, we're, can you ask that question again, actually? Yeah. Are there, <laughs> I need to... are there any destinations that you'd, you know, you've not been to that you'd like to go and check out on your travels? Um, yeah, I think there's there's a bunch. Uh, some, some, I've still probably, from my climbing days, I, I've still wanted to go to the Himalayas, actually. <laughs> Really? Not for kiting. But just get up a mountain. Yeah, I, but I'm not, I know there is some kiting over that way. So I think at one stage I might try and line a trip up somewhere out to the, or to the Karakoram uh, where K2 is or places. And I might do some kind of research and see if there's some places where I can go kite and as a kind of travel story, um, go somewhere like that. Another thing that we're we've got back into is we're working with um, the Cabrina Quest again for another five years now. Okay, so that's signed up. Yeah, so we're, we're working with these guys who have this amazing boat and kind of five-year travel plan to circumnavigate the globe, basically. Um, and it's some of the places they visited on the last kind of three years were just amazing. Probably half of them don't even have names. They're just, you know, in the vicinity and the boat will just turn up and you know, they'll sleep somewhere and they'll ride some point break wave that's, you know, no one's on and it's in the middle of nowhere, basically. So I'm definitely keen to uh, get yourself on that. To get a couple of trips back on the quest. Yeah. Once that kicks off, I think it, it'll it be back. Um, it'll be back on the, the water in, um, in a few months. So I awesome. think they're planning already middle of 28, 2019 that starts again so i think they're already pretty much sold out the first year so wow i know that they've got some amazing destinations on the cards so did you ever get um, to go on it before or would that be a new i didn't experience? i didn't so that's probably why that's probably you why like, I definitely want to line that yeah one the year before i started they went to the marshall islands which is meant to be everyone talks about it the brand and it's it's always, oh, you remember the Marshall Islands trip? Oh, you remember the Marshalls? <laughs> yeah. Everyone was on it. it, seems. So it literally, they took the whole team, you know, everyone and all the staff. And it just, it sounded the most unbelievable of trips. And, yeah. And uh, the riders talk about it and the staff talk about it. And it just, it just looks, you know, the dream destination. So, so fingers crossed. I would, I would say at one stage I need to try and get down there. Um, Anyway, I mean it's not too far from Maui actually, but it's quite a tricky, a tricky Place to journey. To. Yeah, yeah, and actually it ends up being quite a long, a long journey to get to it. So, yeah, I don't know. There's, I'm pretty, 
there's no no one place that I really kind of have on a hit list. Um, there's I, I still enjoy the culture of traveling and meeting new people and seeing new places. So I think if it's somewhere new, I'm always uh, I'm Keen always kind of you know I'll, I'll always say yes really to it if someone says oh do you want to go there. Like, yeah, normally say yeah, all right. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> yeah, get okay over there. Yeah, um, yeah. One of the last things I wanted to ask you about is you're a very talented photographer and videographer, and that's been a big part of your career, I guess, and underlying. You know, maybe not such a focus. A lot of people don't realise how many pictures that you take that Cabrini uses. Your name's always on the bottom of them, but unless you look really hard, you won't see it. What do you look for when you're shooting a photo to make it unique or different you know what's your your sort of goal I guess when you're taking pictures um probably from a nowadays from a kind of marketing side I look I look for lots of branding logos everywhere I always try and shoot um I make maybe not logos but make sure the kite's in it and not just for that reason also I like to see a picture where the kite's in it I always think it's a shame when you see a picture if it's just the book, the rider because if someone's looking in from outside the industry or I think it's really unique for them and it helps them understand what's going on when they see the kite um, so I, th- I think that's one thing that I always like to see because you know we're, we're kite surfing we're doing it with a kite so I think it's really important to see the kite now that's not always the easiest thing Thanks, to shoot yeah. if the kites you know it can be 22 meters up in the air um, and that's when working with like the riders and the more time you get to work with them and and tell them kind of what you need it really helps like working with I think working with someone like Kiahi is probably the the best type of person to ride with because even though they're they're riding waves, which in general guys don't really like to have their kite down. Whereas him, he will he will put it on the water and hit the lip. He'll be even higher than the kite if it's a big wave, and he'll stick it down because he he knows that you know you're you're shooting just for that, and he'll make sure it's down so that you know if you're shooting long lens, it's in the shot, and then you can see what's going on. You don't just see the the guy riding a wave because to all intents and purposes, that's just surfing. Yeah. You know, if someone's looking at it, they say, oh, a guy surfing a wave. But if it's, you see that there's a kite and the line's connected to the guy that's riding that wave, it's kite surfing. It makes a connection. So I always, I always try, if possible, to shoot. And that might mean shooting wide angle or fisheye from the water. It might mean shooting long lens from and hiking another kind of, you know, few hundred meters away. So that then when you're punching in on the whole scene, you get everything. Um, so that's kind of the one thing I always try to look for. I think it's, it's a, it's a good thing to, especially for photos. I mean, video is a bit different because the scene's always changing. So you, you know, you might see a hack, but not the kite, but then the kite might come into shot and things like that. So, um, but with pictures, it's, it's, you know, you've got that one frame that someone's going to look at. It's not going to change, you know, how you, how you kind of structure it, you know, what, what's in it you know foreground background there's so much you can do with it you know it's not just point a camera I think that's kind of mostly what what people don't really kind of yeah. pick up on if you just I think it's if easy. someone says I'll just take a picture and they'll just point the camera at a rider and they'll click the button they won't kind of think well How can I where am it? I stood kind of oh is there if I walk backwards what am I going to see or if I'm going to use this lens what am I going to see and kind of imagine it and then also then think you know well so how are you going to get that does that mean being in the water does that mean being somewhere else or I guess now nowadays it also means is that going to be taken with a heli as well or yeah with a drone so um, there's such possibilities now for all these different angles I mean and that's one of the good things with drones really you can now you can really kind of line up having the kite in certain certain spots which before you know you had to you had to kind of do you with with the, the rider to do it but I think working with certain riders it's 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 definitely easier or it's a kind of They've pleasure. Got an understanding of what you need. Yeah and, and it kind of ties back in with 
you know, the free ride project, that's kind of what we did. We, we kind of analyzed that pretty early, especially when we're taking pictures for the mags. We kind of, we talked to each other all the time and said, I'll do this. It'll look better or make sure your kite's low. So it's in the shot. And, um, a lot with the weight tricks, it was not too bad because it was, the kite was meant to be low. So we we're always we we're like, oh, this will look sick if the kite's yeah. low, and <laughs> so I guess so we're like it's... crashing kites into water to get the shot. But quite a handy sort of schooling experience, I guess. You've got four of arguably some of the best riders on the planet shooting lots of media, and then obviously looking back at it and working out what looks best and how things can look better, and then that stands you in good stead for the rest of your career in terms of photography and filming. Do you prefer video or photos these days? Uh, I definitely prefer the workflow of photos. It's a bit less time intensive. Um, I also quite like how a photo is just one snapshot of anything. You know, you've got to tell a story in a photo, whereas with a video, you you know, you can have however long you want to do to tell that story. Um, I do kind of see them as two really different disciplines and um from video i've got so much respect of how long it takes the editing process and also the creative process yeah of how you know to make a have an idea of a a structure for a video and how you're going to shoot it and what's going to be in it and um i think now with having less time really um because i'm sat in front of a laptop a lot more and yeah. my excel game's getting pretty strong <laughs> that actually it's i've got so less time and, video, and um, yeah. yeah and just the whole editing process you know that's it, it's a full-time job basically to have someone doing that whereas photos is still editing photos and still taking photos is part of it's probably the part of my job that i love the most because it's it's where i'm i still kind of can be really creative and actually be feels kind of like we're working with the riders or you know in the water it's just it's good because it's such a good feeling to just jump in and you know and take stills and tell someone you know or what you want because then you're not whatever job title you are you're just a photographer yeah. in the water taking pictures if i was a pro rider and i wanted to get your attention because I want to join the Cabrina team. Yeah. How do I go about doing that? Not that I'm a pro rider or I want to get your attention, but I'm guessing someone listens to this podcast is like, oh, you know, that's the marketing manager for Cabrina. How do I, you know, I've, I've sent them 200 emails and no one's ever replied. How do I How do I get in touch with them? What's the way to get you to respond, I guess? You must get hundreds of people emailing you asking um, for sponsorship deals. They don't normally email, actually. They, uh, they send a message on Facebook or something. Like <laughs> actually, now Instagram seems the modern, to be the one. The modern world that we um, live in. So I'd probably start with saying, send an email. <laughs> <laughs> send it to, yeah, james at cabrinakites.com. <laughs> Structure it in the right way. Yeah, and I would I would definitely add some kind of portfolio of, you know, what, what you're going to do, what you can do. It's now, it seems, most people generally what, requests look like are this is me i love kite surfing i've got x amount of followers on facebook i've got x amount of followers on instagram give me free kites and money that's that's, that's it that's tend to how a lot of them look um, that's bad isn't it so i would really think about what you know what you can bring to a to a to a brand you know uh, it's it's it it costs brands a lot of money to give gear to riders so they they naturally want to see you know something come of it so you know if it's then it goes back a little bit to what i was saying is you don't need to necessarily be the best rider but try and be creative and think well what what can i do that you know is useful to this brand i think in general you know we're we're all here to sell kites so number one is is can you have an effect um on sales um you know if, if that's that's a big thing that's always going to be the fundamental thing at the top is can i affect sales and how i'm going to do that and and then brand awareness how can you know how can how can i make a difference that maybe some other rider isn't doing yeah um and there's just 
there is there are so many young riders out there that are aspiring to be pro riders and and there aren't really that many places available for you know pro riders there's a finite amount of companies and and there's there's a finite kind of amount of kites that can be sold each year so there seems an infinite amount of wannabes <laughs> pretty much yeah so how can you be different i guess is yeah that's the main one you know what can you do and um what can you kind of bring to to a brand that you know is and and you know learn a bit about the brand also yeah it's a, a big thing it's not just you know you, you sometimes get the feeling you've you've got you've got a generic email that's been sent to 10 other brands hoping um, that someone bites yeah and and you know and and that's not that's that's that goes back to you know our kind of values when we look at a rider we're not we're not just wanting to take the guy because whatever maybe he he's had a we've given him a better offer than someone else has it's because there's a fit we like you know the, the personality fits you know what they what they want to do what their values are yeah where they want to go what they where they want to be in kind of 5 years 10 years time um not just if it's you know the same as everybody else if it's the same generic kind of path that someone else has taken um that's you know being different is that's what we want it's um, the key be different yeah. i got an email the other day and it was like dear core <laughs> i'm this <laughs> i'm jimmy with kiting blah 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 i really want you to sponsor me you know signed off and so i applied to him i was like first off you send me an email that doesn't say dear core <laughs> because you've just you've, you've ruined it from you your set, your second word you did you just turn me right off <laughs> because that instantly is just yeah made me hit delete. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well there we go for anyone listening you now know how to get on the cabrini team be different and send an email with a decent proposal not just a another instagram wish list or begging message um james thanks a lot for that i think we've been chatting for a while once we've edited out the telephone calls and yeah, various interruptions probably, we'll probably have a good podcast there. there's probably yeah, plenty to delete yeah <laughs> probably the first half an hour my backstory <laughs> all right the rubbish no i think it's interesting <laughs> it's good excellent we shall end it there there we have it episode 11 in the bag i really hope you enjoyed it i've got a bit of traveling lined up over the next few weeks So hopefully while I'm out and about in the big wide world, I'll pick up some more episodes for you too. If you enjoyed this latest episode, then please give it a thumbs up. Share it on social media and tell your friends about it. The more people that tune in, the more it inspires me to keep going with this project. Until next week, you've been listening to Rue Chater and the Intriguing Beings podcast.